Good afternoon and welcome to the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus. We're so excited that you joined us today. We've got some great information that we're going to share with you this today. This webinar is sponsored by the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, and the Michigan Prevention Research Center. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be your moderator today. My name is Yvonne Lewis. I'm the co-director for the Community Corps of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. As we get started today, I want to remind you that if you have questions, please go to the bottom of your screen if you're in the webinar. Uh, click on that Q&A button and put those questions in the queue. I see you're already bringing those questions into the queue today. Thank you so much for that. If you are not able to join us via the webinar, you can join us by YouTube. Thank you for all of those that are YouTube or Facebook listening to us. Email us any questions that you might have at info at hfrcc.org, either during the webinar or before, so we can get those questions answered for you. Today, we have an amazing panel that is, continues to be with us here for the 66 weeks now. Today, week 66 of the webinar, our panel of partners are here to answer questions for you. So as you put those questions in the queue, we will be sure that they're answering those questions for you. Today, our topics are post-traumatic slave disorder slash syndrome. We're going to be talking about the Federal Water Settlement. With, uh, re with respect to informed consent and trust. The Genesee County Health Department will be here today and we'll update you on COVID vaccines and testing. We will hear a presentation from the governor's office, our own Gary Jones, and then we'll have our policy update and some other announcements for you today. So please stay tuned and take this opportunity to share, send someone else the message that we're on this webinar today with information from the Flint community that gives some context to the coronavirus. How are we dealing with this in Flint? So I'm, I'm excited to have Gary Jones with us today from the governor's office. He's got some great information and I'm sure all of us have been sitting on the edges of our seat to hear this news today. So Gary, please give us the update from the governor's office. Uh, yes, good afternoon everyone. So yesterday, uh, Governor Whitmer accelerated the in all COVID-19 epidemic orders on gatherings and masking. As COVID-19 cases continue to plummet following increased vaccinations. So beginning June 22nd, capacity in both indoor and outdoor settings will increase to 100% and the state will no longer require residents to wear a face mask. Nearly 5 million Michiganders ages 16 and older have received their first vaccine dose, according to uh, the CDC. Also, according to data from the Michigan Care Improvement Registry, half of Michigan residents have completed their vaccination and over 60% have gotten their first shots. Case rates, percent positivity, and hospitalizations have all plummeted over the past several weeks. And currently, Michigan is experiencing 24 cases per million and has recorded a 1.9 positivity rate over the last seven days. MDHHS will continue to provide recommendations to keep Michiganders safe and reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission in higher risk settings and places where vulnerable populations or populations with large numbers of individuals are not yet fully vaccinated. Also, the governor recently uh, announced the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, or LEO, in partnership with uh, the Michigan College Access Network, uh, awarded a total of $750,000 to nine community colleges in order to improve student success rates among adult students. My community college will receive one of those grants to implement support models for delivering a program to ensure that adult students who need need extra need in college level courses during their first year. The governor also issued a proclamation recently uh, today declaring uh, June 19th as Juneteenth Celebration Day in Michigan. Since day one, both the governor and lieutenant governor have been committed to making Michigan a more equitable state. The governor appointed the most diverse cabinet in Michigan's history to ensure that government uh, looks more like the people that it represents. And last year, the governor established the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities uh, to study the causes of racial disparities and recommend actions to address the historical and systemic inequities. And of course, I always have to thank Dr. Perholden for her leadership uh, as a part of the, as a member of that task force. And also upon recommendation uh, by that very same task force, uh, the governor issued a directive 
which directed uh, licensing and regulatory affairs to begin creating rules that included an implicit bias training requirement. Uh, also, uh, the governor announced uh, her support for hero pay for frontline and essential workers in Michigan uh, with billions of dollars relief uh, uh, available in the legislature. Uh, this hero pay proposal, which was put forth by Senator Bullock of Detroit and our very own uh, Representative Neely of Flint, uh, would provide one-time payments to essential employees for their service through the pandemic as they kept the state and their fellow Michiganders moving forward. Uh, both House and Senate Democrats are looking to build on previous actions that Michigan took for hero pay for frontline essential workers, including a one-time $1,000 uh, for first responders and a $2 per hour increase for direct care workers. Uh, the governor also signed an executive directive requiring MDHHS to take necessary actions to prohibit the use of state and federal funds, the harmful practice of conversion therapy on minors. The directive also requires departments and agencies to explore further actions that can be taken to protect minors from this harmful practice. And lastly, the governor announced her proposal to invest $1.4 billion in federal child care funding to expand access to high quality child care, make child care more affordable, and support. She chimed in right at the right time when I was talking about <laughs> child care. So, yeah, that's, that's my daughter, everyone. Um, and to make child care more affordable and support child care professionals as part of uh, her economic jumpstart plan. The plan helps people get back to work and support their families while giving them peace of mind to know that their children are safe and learning. Always like to end uh, with plugging the catch all website. So michigan.gov backslash COVID vaccine and michigan.gov backslash coronavirus are uh, still the best websites to keep up with all updates. Thank you so much, Gary. And your daughter gave us a perfect segue to the round table today. So we appreciate that update from the governor. But we want to ask our panelists uh, today to join us in the round table, Dr. Furholden, Dr. Hacker, Dr. Lawrence, Dr. Jennifer Edwards Johnson. I'm telling you, we've got and I see that you're all here. Now, these late breakers, I tell you, we got some couple of late breakers that happened today and yesterday. As, as Gary just told us, the governor says 100% now we're going back. Um, and we talked about back to normal, Michigan back to normal last week, and now 100% opening up on Tuesday. And then we also heard the declaration about Juneteenth. Uh, so I want to open this panel up and just let's talk about what this all means. Children, families, how are we going to be impacted, and what are your recommendations for us as a community? Um, I, I'm going to ask Dr. Derber just to kick it off because Gary mentioned that you had something to do with some of the, the uh, decisions that were made by the governor through this task force. Yeah, the task force and, and, and very much like our local task force, you know, it's a heavy lift, right? Because um, we're supposed to be there representing multiple sectors and multiple communities. And I mean, I really enjoy our local task force and the governor's task force because it is broad, it is diverse, it is inclusive. Um, I'm in Florida right now. They don't have a mask mandate here. I still wear my mask. You know, as a public health person, I want to scream out, don't do it. Don't lift the mask mandate. Don't do it. But then I also realize, you know, we've set some standards in place. And as we start to approach those standards, you know, people are looking for and, and really doing the work to see, you know, what things are going to look like for us. So I'm going a, I'm to a quote Dr. Reynolds and my mama. You know, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump behind them? No. So I'm going to still continue to wear my mask. I'm going to still continue to um, honor protocol. And I just encourage others um, to do the same. I feel good about the work that we've done, both at the state and the local level, and giving people good information to keep them safe. So I just ask people to keep doing the right thing. You know, it doesn't, the, the law doesn't say you can't wear a mask. It says you don't have to. But, you know, I still recommend for people when you're out um, in public. And the biggest thing that I really want people to do is continue to be an advocate and a champion for people in their lives to get vaccinated. Great. So I see head nodding. Dr. Reynolds, Dr. EJ, Dr. Hacker, jump right in. I'll defer to our health department director first. Well, I'm going to give you my personal, my personal response to that. 
it's so funny because I will go into a spot and when I approach the cashier, I put my mask on and then I still feel compelled to say, I'm vaccinated. <laughs> it just, it's like, okay, you know, it's like, I just want them to know that I'm not putting it on because I wasn't vaccinated. I want to put them on because I care about them. And so if I am, um, you know, far away from someone, like, you know, very far away, I will take it off while I'm shopping and then I put it back on though if I come in close contact with people. But I just find it very interesting that I feel compelled to like, you know, give that extra message. Like, you know, I'm vaccinated. I just want to make sure to take care of you. And I think that that is a good message though. And I think that um, that is where we need to go. And I think that people need to realize that we have a whole paradigm shift of what's been happening in the workplaces in the last last 25 years as people started going away from vacation time and sick time and calling it personal time but keeping it the same as your vacation time people were less inclined to use their sick time and um, because there was no longer sick time it was now personal time that could be used as a vacation and I think we really have to move back and contemplate those kind of things that when people are sick, we don't know if it's the start of the next pandemic. We don't know if it's a novel flu this year. And we have to start being careful with each other. And that's, that's the message that I just really want to continue. Care for each other. So, so, so Dr. Reynolds, Dr. EJ, you are both um, physicians. I don't know, Dr. Hecker's a physician, but she's serving in the health officer role. So from that physician perspective, what do you share with us? You know, it's interesting because most recently when I was rounding in the hospital, I saw some kids who had rhinovirus, something completely different that we, it's the, basically the common cold, but it's something we're not really thinking about, right? Because we've been focused on coronavirus. So I think I kind of echo Dr. Hacker's some sentiments of like, we have to be careful. We have to be thoughtful. We need to, we don't know what the next sort of pandemic might be and protecting each other is important. And so from my standpoint, Point, particularly while I'm seeing patients, I still have on my mask. Um, I'm still being really careful. I'm still washing my hands a lot. Um, and you can hear my kids in the background, but that's the other thing, right? Is kids are still the nidus for all sorts of infectious disease. And we haven't vaccinated all of our children yet. Um, so that's still a big piece of this. And we have to be thoughtful about that as well. And I will say as a pediatrician, as a grandparent, I have to model what I'm asking my grandsons uh, and my uh, adult children uh, and my nieces and nephews uh, should do under these circumstances. And many of them are tw under the age of 12. So if I'm going to require my four-year-old grandsons to wear a mask when they're out in public, so will I. So they can say, I'm going to do just like Poppy does, because this is how we learn to act appropriately in life. Uh, and so I will continue to wear a mask and I'll say I'm 69 years old and I'm still quoting my mother from when I was not jumping off any bridges. I will continue to advocate for layers of protection and I will insist that vaccination is the essential fundamental layer of protection but we still have masks, social distancing, hand washing, keeping our hands out our faces uh, when we can, uh, and also relying on our government for accurate information because misinformation uh, breaks down that layer of protection of accurate information. So that's one of the things that we hope you're going to gain from the webinar, those of you that are participating, that you're hearing from our health professionals, whether they be in an academic institution as an epidemiologist or physician. And Dr. Hacker, yes, is still seeing patients. So we get that good information from her as well as she's seeing patients. And so there's, a, there, there's so many avenues to this. So we just want to make sure that we provide this opportunity for you as leaders in our community to help us get the information right and make sure that we know what the proper protocols are. So thank you for that. One other late breaking opportunity uh, we talked about earlier, I, I woke up this morning and I saw the, the president had signed a declaration 
uh, and uh, I want I want to get it right. So uh, help us here. This is going to be something that's going to make a difference even tomorrow, as we have a new national holiday. Well, it's made a lot of difference for people today, because the holiday was declared. It was uh, signed by President Joe Biden yesterday. I almost fell over on Wednesday when I saw that the Senate, our U.S. Senate, had unanimously voted in favor of what's called the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act. It made it through the House. President Biden signed it into law yesterday. I myself had a very important meeting with the CDC today from one to three, and they politely said, sorry guys, federal holiday, and they rescheduled the meeting for Monday. So many of our federal and many state partners, um, so I feel bad for anybody who didn't make it to the bank yesterday because some banks have even decided to honor the holiday. We'll get it all right by next year, but the actual holiday and the day is commemorated on June 19th. It commemorates what happened on June 19th, 1865 in Galveston, Texas, in Galveston, Texas where some enslaved peoples first learned that in fact they had been freed through the Emancipation Proclamation, which went into effect January two years earlier. So it's a seminal day, I think, um, for our nation and for people of color and for black people and people who are the descendants of people who were enslaved. Can you imagine not knowing that you were actually free and being enslaved for an additional two plus years and here we are 150 years later, still fighting for equity and the true expression of freedom for all people. So it's, it's not gonna solve the problems, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Thank you, Dr. For Holden. And we're gonna hear some more about this later because uh, this month is um, PTSD, PTSD, and I always wanna add another letter, but post-traumatic, uh, stress disorder. And there's some additional information we're going to learn about today. But I wanted to just give our panelists just one quick uh, additional opportunity to chime in on what this means. Thank you. What this means for us as a community, uh, having Juneteenth celebrated here tomorrow, but also being able to now go out and be amongst everybody in a larger way. So I'm going to give you a, a space, Dr. Hackett. I want to hear from Dr. EJ, then Dr. Reynolds. I just want to say I, I was so happy and so excited about it yesterday. And to have all the events that we have planned already in the community um, to, I don't know, it just seems like it's kind of treasured to be able to say, yeah, we had this already going, and now it's going to be recognized nationally. I just, it, it means a lot. Dr. EJ. I second that. Um, and it really hit home when my mom sent me a text and she was like, can you believe it? This has become a federal holiday. And for, you know, whenever your parents kind of are talking about sort of historic things that happen in the country and they give you that context, you really feel it. Um, Flint has all had like last year, the Juneteenth celebration in Flint was phenomenal, right? It really embodied the culture. It was exciting. It just, it bubbled up joy in you. So this is sort of an extension of that. And I hope people get to experience it. Thank you. Dr. Reynolds, last word. Yes, ma'am. It's another step forward, but we still have work to do. So instead of barbecuing, partying, we need to reflect on, are you registered to vote? Uh, because that's what people died for equality under the law and the right to vote and the right to protect their home and their property. So let's continue in that effort. Uh, and we also want health equity. So uh, one day we'll have a real Juneteenth celebration. Thank you, Dr. Riddles. And that, that's, again, another perfect segue when we talk about really understanding what's going on in this community. Thank you all for your sharing. We want to hear from the health department now an update on what's happening here locally as it relates to, and we talked about the pandemic um, with respect to the, the protocols. And we've done a lot of good work here in Flint. And Matt Peters is going to tell us today about what's happening through the Genesee County Health Department for an update. 
Good afternoon, Matt. Good afternoon, Yvonne. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm here uh, filling in for uh, Sherelle, who is enjoying a hard-earned vacation right now. And she actually celebrated her birthday yesterday. So if you see her around, make sure to wish her a happy birthday. Um, but I'm here just to share a little bit about the health department's um, progress, both in um, cases and in vaccination. Um, we go to the um, next slide, please. I just I have before uh, Gary Jones came out and gave his great presentation about the reopening. I had included some slides about it, but he did such a good job that I, we don't need to go over it. So. Um, starting with our newest COVID-19 stats, um, our cases have decreased again by 24% from last week. We only had 26 cases in the last seven days. This is phenomenal. Uh, if you'll remember back at the peak of the pandemic, we were seeing 400, 500 cases a day. Now only 26 in the last seven days. Uh, our positivity rate has dropped all the way to 1.3%. Uh, sure, I'll inform you guys last week that that was a record uh, at 3% and now at 1.3, a brand new record. So that's another a uh, really good indicator um, that things are going in the right direction. And finally, hospital capacities in, uh, in um, inpatient rates continue to decrease. We actually have more free uh, ICU beds than COVID inpatient uh, cases right now, which is phenomenal. Um, another thing that is, is relatively new over the course of the pandemic we've seen uh, very often high hospital frequency. So it, it's fantastic to see that uh, decrease. Um, however, I will like to echo some of the wisdom from our roundtable and say that um, while things are going in a fantastic direction, there's always room for more improvement. Um, and if you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, we've never had more opportunity for that. And more vaccinations can, can only help us going forward. You know, we don't know what the virus could throw at us in the coming months. Things have obviously changed very quickly over the last year or so. So we like to be as prepared as possible. But overall, things are looking good. Next slide, please. So Matt, can you just briefly touch on the upcoming clinics that are happening this week? We do have some, actually today there's a clinic going on. Yes, um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, my internet is a little bit slow right now. Um, so we do have a clinic um, today at, I believe at, um, sorry, my slides are- It's are, Our Lady are, of Guadalupe off. today, yeah. Our Lady, yes, till two, two o'clock today. Um, so. If um, um, you're watching this and you think, oh, geez, I should go get vaccinated right now, you can run over there and do it. They're open until two. They're, they have Pfizer, which is for uh, folks 12 and up, and Moderna for folks who are 18 and up. Um, and um, so those are over available. You don't even need to make an appointment. You can just walk in. Um, additionally, we'll be having another clinic on Wednesday, June 23rd uh, the, at Central Church of the Nazarene. Um, they will have Pfizer uh, and Johnson & Johnson. That's from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, and again, you can make an appointment if you'd like through the health department website, but you don't have to. You can just walk in and get your vaccination. Um, and additionally, we have been, we've, as I'm sure Sherelle has kept you informed, we've been partnering with um, Curative Labs um, over at the Diplomat Pharmacy Building who are providing clinics um, from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, very frequently. Uh, you can, again, go over there without an appointment. All that information is also included on the health department's website. But um, there's never been a greater uh, amount of opportunity to receive your vaccination um, in Genesee County right now. Matt, do you have the information about the um, vaccination uh, opportunities during the Juneteenth events? Uh, no, I, I do not have that um, in my presentation. Okay, we, we do have three different events that there will be vaccine um, available. Um, a couple other additional events where the vaccine information will be available. And um, I will try and get that so I can post it in the uh, chat here. Thank you, Dr. Hacker.
Thank you. And so we do know we have some testing sites. We still want to get people tested, even though our numbers are looking good. It's important to get the testing done. Uh, and so those sites are made available for us today. And then, as Matt said, uh, there's no more registration uh, required. So you can just get yourself scheduled to get an appointment today. And then a number of opportunities. So thank you so much for that update, Matt. And then there is an opportunity for you to get more information by visiting the website, gchd.us. And they will be happy to respond to you. Or you can call the COVID call center at 810-344-4800 for help as well. So thank you so much, Matt, for that presentation. We appreciate it. And we'll look forward to you filling in again when Sherelle's off on a really wonderful uh, day of rest and relaxation. We talked to you a little bit earlier about uh, the post-traumatic slave disorder and syndrome. We have a special presentation for you today. Um, maybe some of you are not aware, but in the African tradition, there was a historian known as a griot. And that individual would make sure that all the community members understood the history and how that in history impacted their lives and then set a path for the future. We're fortunate to have right here in our own community, our own griot, Ms. E. Hill Deloney, who will give us a presentation today about post-traumatic slave disorder syndrome. And then we'll talk a little bit more about Juneteenth. So welcome, Ms. Deloney. We're glad to have you today. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank the Health of Flint Research Coordinator Center for inviting me to speak on the issue of post-traumatic slavery disorder. I shall discuss the trauma that affects individual citizens of the Flint community. And I should also discuss how we as a community, specifically we as African-American residents, have experienced the compound trauma of the water crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, the crucifixion of George Floyd, and ongoing institutional racism. Post-traumatic slavery disorder is a condition that exists when a community or population has experienced the multi-generational trauma of slavery, including institutional racism, resulting in a mindset that disrupts the healthy psychology and spirituality of that community or population. An example is a belief, real or imagined, that the benefits of the society in which we live are not accessible to us. Post-traumatic stress syndrome is a society in which we live, the community population with the trouble, the traumatic stress disorder is an individual. The post-traumatic uh, traumatic stress disorder in a community of population is a parallel concept of post-traumatic stress disorder in an individual. Trauma affects entire populations of human beings, such as African-American citizens, in response to the abject horror of slavery. Individuals may suffer post-trauma effects for months or years. Communities, individuals can, may suffer post-traumatic effect for many months. Communities may suffer traumatic effects for decades. Whole populations may endure the ravages of post-trauma for generations. And it must be stated that the traumatic effects occur in all three of these levels simultaneously. And this is where we must have more research uh, needs to be done. Trauma affects people physically, mentally, and spiritually. The stress from trauma can result in the physical ailments of high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and the predisposition to other diseases such as COVID. Traumatic stress can cause psychological impediments like anxiety, depression, emotional imbalances, shame, hopelessness, and most importantly, self-hatred. And post-traumatic stress threatens to morally wound us spiritually. This assault on spirituality is especially important for African-Americans. Dr. Patricia Newton pioneered and trans trademarked the scientific term post-traumatic slavery disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. 
to explain the impact of how repeated trauma experienced by Africans during 400 years of slavery, terrorism, and oppression was passed down through generations and affected the mental health and spiritual health of people of African descent. Through the initial trauma of this anti-African evil, African-American people unintentionally absorbed these negative values, images, and expectations associated with enslavement, thus permeating and poisoning the physical and mental health of African-Americans and our divine spiritual order. Dr. Newton applied the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, which is a psychiatric diagnosis for an individual person with physical and psychological symptoms associated with exposure to a traumatic event to a group of people, African-Americans, whose ancestors experienced the trauma of slavery and ourselves persevering through the still continuing myriad of racist white supremacist aftermath. Prosomatic slavery disorder, PTSD, provides a framework to understand a pattern of physical, emotional, and spiritual damage resulting from centuries of slavery and continuing racism and oppression. The effects of PT slavery can be imagined to cause widespread rewiring of the minds and brains of African Americans, interfering with how we view the world, how we feel, and how we think about ourselves. A mind exposed to generations of trauma carries the horrible memories associated with the trauma. The world is experienced, the world is experienced as a dangerous and threatening place, causing one to be hyper aroused and full of fear. Ultimately, these intergenerational traumatic brain changes can result in the abnegation of traditional values. Dr. Truman's findings are supported by Dr. Joy DeRue and her work on the science of epigenetics. The stress of systemic racism creates a toxic environment that can directly affect how important genes actually function. And these genetic effects can be passed on to future generations. Thus the toxic environments of slavery, Jim Crow oppression and frank racism, as well as ever present structural racism can have lasting effects on the survivors of slavery and the racism that continues. Dr. Patricia Newton, who was an international claim psychiatrist, has observed that instead of people of African descent, seeing ourselves as spiritual beings created in the image of the higher power, we have learned to love the higher power, but hate ourselves, thus distorting our view of the higher power and ourselves. This supports her thesis that if the lens of the mind is cloudy and constantly under trauma, the lens through which African-Americans see the higher power can result in a dysfunctional spirituality. The compound trauma of the water crisis, then the COVID-19 pandemic, and then the ongoing protests of the crucifixion of George Floyd in 2020 have dangerously impacted the well-being of our African-American communities mentally, spiritually, and physically. Dr. Newton proposed a way forward to unblock this path to spiritual development. The path that would provide a new framework that would promote physical, psychological, and spiritual healing ultimately results in reclaiming the divine self, our divine self. She said, if we are to make the most of the gift of freedom that our ancestors secured for us, we need to be diligent. It, we mustn't practice as implement, implementing practices that will result in a new virtual system. The compound distress of COVID-19 and the crucifixion of George Floyd 
highlighted racial disparities, further exacerbating the consistent trauma experienced by African-American people who have always fought to breathe with the knee of the systemic racism on our neck. The weight of the stress of this crisis resulted in a more pronounced and deadly cocktail of racism clouding the mind, body, soul, and spirit. It's not only set off a firestorm of protests around the world, but also triggered post-traumatic slavery disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and its layered effects of trauma for African-Americans already experiencing more severe complications, more deaths, and more economic hardship due to COVID-19. The pandemic in itself is a painful reminder of the very inequalities that people are protesting. The effect of post-traumatic slavery disorder were also visible in the African-American church, overwhelmed by the pandemic protest crisis in the African-American community as they ne 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 navigated the European-American dominated patriotic systems of the church and its oppression. However, during this time of crisis, it was more troubling for the, for the African American church to experience the blatant ignorance and insensitivity of the conservative and evangelical church. Generally, European evangelicals view the high power through the lens of Christian religious supremacy and masculinity. This anti-African American lens frames their theology and determines how they see and interpret the higher power. This biased view tends to ignore the systems of anti-African American violence and European supremacy, both subtle, actually microaggressions and overt, race, overt racism in a uh, system so as not to disrupt their power and how hierarchy of European suppression. Dr. James Cohn, the father of Black liberation theology, stressed the importance of Black Christians to embrace a frame of our own by developing a theology that focuses on the higher power in our struggle for justice for the oppressed. Pastoria and now United States Senator Raphael Warnock, a student of Dr. Cohn, learn how to interrogate and unmask the unknowledged cultural biases and races, sexist and classist assumptions of dominant discourse in the church. He said that it is this ingrained racism that causes white evangelicals to continuously support racist practices and miss the call to support the oppressed through social justice movements. A new wave of liberation theology partnered with liberation psychology emerged in 2020, when we witnessed African-American churches emancipating themselves from racial religious institutions like the Southern Baptist Convention and white evangelicals institutions that not only focus to the survival races, but double down on their support for racist political agendas. The African church is waging war now against the post-traumatic slavery disorder, PTSA, for forging a new path to spiritual development and divinity by reclaiming its African mind. Thank our you, job Mr. today is to reclaim our African minds. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Deloney. Uh, we have some references, some of the material that you shared. You provided with us some references today. And so we're going to put these references up on the screen for those of you that are uh, viewing the webinar today. And for those of you that will view it, you can read some of the background information on these two uh, concepts, the post-traumatic slave disorder and the post-traumatic slave stress uh, syndrome as you and, and learn more about this. We also wanna just take another quick moment to emphasize that tomorrow is Juneteenth. And on Juneteenth, some of the information that happened historically will be shared. One, 
as Black Wall Street. There's some information, actually, this is today, Black Wall Street at Burston Field House. Tomorrow, there will be a Freedom Festival. And then on Sunday, there will be a Gospel Festival. And I also know that there will be events held at the um, Flint Cultural Center on tomorrow. Is that correct, Ms. D? Mrs. Deloney, there will be information shared at the Cultural Center on tomorrow, on Saturday? Yeah, well, actually, uh the original traditional Juneteenth committees will actually start today. And uh, we start from two o'clock to six o'clock at, at Sloan Museum. We have activities for the families from there from two to six. Tomorrow we will begin at um, the park at Pasadena and at, at 12 Max noon park. actually. Excuse me? At Max Brandon Park. Max Brandon Park at 12 noon. We will have activities, we have greeting of the the commissioners, we have a whole array of activities until five o'clock. And at Thank five o'clock, our motorcade will begin and it will go from uh, Brandon Park all the way down to Black Lives Matter at uh, University Avenue where activities will continue. Thank you, Ms. Deloney. And also there will be uh, vaccines available at Burston Field House on tomorrow for those who are interested in getting vaccines at, at Burston from one to five, Curative Lab will also be providing vaccines. Michigan United will be working in conjunction with the Genesee County Health Department, and they are expected to be at the farmer's market on tomorrow from 10 to 2 p.m. So they're again, I'm connecting uh, the questions that some have asked, where will those opportunities be? Continue to look for opportunities to learn more about uh, Juneteenth tomorrow, today and tomorrow, as well as getting uh, opportunities for those of you that would like to get their vaccines. Thank you again, Ms. Deloney, for that, those insights. Uh, we wanna bring now Dr. Lawrence Reynolds. Dr. Lawrence Reynolds is a retired pediatrician uh, in the city of Flint, and he has been on a real journey. And a question came up, Dr. Reynolds, I hope you saw it in the, in the queue, uh, regarding the Flint Water Settlement. And we, we call it the Flint Water Settlement, but most of us know it is a federal settlement. And so Dr. Reynolds, you have a, some updates that you'd like to share with us today. Oh yes, and thank you for the opportunity. And I just wanna ask you all to remember Bob Marley's song, Song of Freedom. And there's a line in there, free yourself from mental slavery. And that's part of the process of healing from post-traumatic. So I really thank uh, Ms. Deloney for bringing that up and laying it out. And now it's time for us to study. And that's what I do. And I encourage you all do to study. Uh, you have heard of the Flint Water Settlement. Uh, and there are aspects of it that are problematic. Uh, and I will outline three major points. Number one, we were not informed, I am a Flint resident, so we were not informed that there was lead in our water until Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha and Mark Edwards showed the correlation between lead in water and how it was processed and lead that was coming out of our taps that we were consuming. And so for a whole year, we were told everything was all right. Well, that creates a problem for blood lead level. Burns formula with tap water that was lead contaminated. And most of their diet for the first six months is tap water. If a mother was breastfeeding, there was also a risk of lead being passed through the breast milk. So for a whole year, we knew nothing. Uh, and typical practice is not to check blood lead levels until a child is 12 months of age, if covered by Medicaid, and repeating it again at two years of age. Uh, so if a child, if one child in that age group was positive, then we would check all the other children in the household. Uh, but since it was denied for a whole year and it was not corrected for several years thereafter, we really do not know what the actual, actual blood lead level was at a most critical time of development for children under five. So then we come to the next problem. Uh, they're gonna use, <laughs> they are calling it a bone scan and that is a complete misnomer. 
there is FDA approved equipment for doing a bone scan on humans for a reason, uh, especially folks who have had occupational exposure and who uh, have acute poisoning. In other words, it's causing symptoms. Right now, one of the law firms that is the, one of the managing lawyer groups for this lawsuit has been using an industrial analyzer on human beings. When I say industrial analyzer, it emits, it emits radiation to detect lead and other heavy metals, but we're talking about lead right now. So if an inspector comes to your house, they'd point it at your wall to see if there's lead in the paint. They'd point it at the soil uh, to see if there's lead in the soil surrounding your home. They'd do a dust sample. Uh, if you got a toy and it was being checked for any lead poisoning, they would point that uh, at the metal toy, a truck, or anything that a child would chew on or put in his or her mouth. Well, this is being used on human beings. Despite the manufacturer saying on at least two occasions, and in their manual, their user's manual, it says, do not point at humans. What is the justification by this law firm for doing it? Because it's cheap and it's quick. And what I ask you is, what is your life worth? Uh, how long are we going to uh, just go along with the flow where someone says, but you can get more money if you do this. If there is a risk, no matter how slight, from radiation exposure, and there's no benefit, and there's nothing that will change your response to the situation, why are you doing it in the chance that you may get more cash? If it's negative, you will still have to pay $500 for that test if your lawyer doesn't. And that goes to cover the expenses of a law firm that engaged in this activity. And then it gets deeper. If you use radiation emitting equipment in the state of Michigan, you must register it with the state. Until I filed a complaint in February, this equipment was not registered until early March. So they broke the law there. Why is, it, why is registration required? And that is so the state knows the equipment is, being, is in the state and they come out to inspect your practices on how you use it. Over 3,000 people were subjected to this device emitting radiation uh, to detect lead in bone without it having been registered by the state or approved by the state. And might I add, this equipment was not approved by the FDA, and I will repeat, the manufacturer says and has repeated in writing to this law firm, do not use this equipment. This law firm has responded, we will not stop. And they give pages upon pages of information. The questions are, when you sign an informed consent for that, did the person inform you that this equipment was not designed for use on humans and the manufacturer said do not use it on humans and it was not registered with the state? At this point, we have no evidence that they did such. When they send you your result, you will find that at the top of your results sheet, it says Harvard University School of Public Health and NYU School of Medicine. They are not affiliated at all with Harvard University or NYU School of Medicine. This is Napoli and Associates operating in a law office, office on Flushing Road. It's conveniently right outside the city. But <laughs> these, are, these are various misrepresentations. Yes, the research physicist uh, is on staff at Harvard. Yes, the medical director is on staff at New York University School of Medicine, but uh, I will tell you, I have failed to find a license 
for that physician in the state of Michigan, and I have failed to find a license for that physician in the state of New York. So why is this rogue research being perpetrated on the Flint community? And they don't care if you're black, white, brown, uh, Asian, they do not care. Uh, they are using this to wrap up this case as quickly as possible. And then finally, let me summarize by saying this. The settlement amount is about $400 million. There are somewhere between 40,000 and 80,000 80, claimants for this money. I want to give you an idea of the magnitude. In the Larry Nasser MSU sexual abuse case, there were 300 claimants, and the settlement amount was $400 million. I'm not trying to say one pain is more than the other or talk about equivalency, but what I'm saying is, why is the magnitude so different? Why? Uh, so before you sign up for a, what they are calling a bone scan, the equipment is not proper. There are not proper safety practices going on. And if they tell you that it's no more radiation that, than what a dentist does, number one, a dentist only does an x-ray if they're looking for something that they're going to treat. Number two, if they do that x-ray, they will put a lead shield on the parts of the body at which they're pointing their x-ray machine. Number three, their x-ray machine is registered and it is approved by the FDA. So I share this information with you so you don't go for the okie doke. And it, it's critical at a time like this that our state and federal government protect us. Because at the same time they're saying trust us on vaccination, and I insist we should trust them on vaccination, they're allowing these people to, uh, to break the law and not provide us with equal protections that are guaranteed under federal regulation, at least for universities, uh, for doing research. They have not met any of the guidelines thereof. I filed a complaint with the state, and now the state of Michigan is doing an investigation, so they say they don't release information in the middle of the investigation, but we've seen signs that this law firm is trying to uh, change their practices. And I guess they're hoping that the state will overlook the, thir the 3,000 people who already had the exam. The maximum penalty under state law for not registering radiation equipment is one, up to $1,000 per illegal use. What's 3,000 times 1,000? This law firm could be on the hook for $3 million. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. And one of the reasons why we have this webinar is because we want to make sure that information is made readily available to our communities. We appreciate you being an advocate and sharing this because that was a question that came from one of our participants. So hopefully the information that Dr. Reynolds shared with you is helpful be mindful. And the most important thing we can always share with you, please do your homework and make informed decisions. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. This is why another reason why we're having the information brought forward to us from uh, Michigan State University regarding the policy up updates. The information that you share, will, they share will be helpful in us learning better how to actually share with our policymakers. So Dr. Deborah for Holden, please bring forward the key information about the policy brief today. Great, so we have some good news around the numbers. We are in our eighth consecutive week of decline and think back to when our community positivity rate was on the order of 20%. That meant about one in five people who were being tested for COVID were testing positive. And we have been on the continuous decline since. Our testing positivity rate, so Again, testing remains widely available in the community. We heard Brother Gary um, tell us what the rates are across the state. I think they're uh, right around in the same order, uh, under 2%. Our testing positivity rate decreased last week from 3% to 1.3%. You know, we heard from Matthew, 26 cases last week. 
um, in Genesee County. So folks, things are, are really going in the right direction. What is not moving at the same pace and at the same rate is our vaccination rates. We have 41% of the total county population age 16 and over is fully vaccinated. And we inched up just a little bit over the 50% mark that we were at last week, the 50.6% of the total population 16 and plus having received their first dose. So again, I just encourage people, be a champion for people in your lives, be a trusted, credible messenger. People still have questions. We've got a lot of answers. We've got a lot of the resources. We wanna do our very best um, to get this thing fully under um, control. If you just look at the graphic of what the numbers look like over the last several weeks, it demonstrates, next slide please, things are continuing to trend in the right direction. We break it down for people and show in Flint, and you can see we had less than 10 cases um, in the city of Flint last week. So I just encourage people, stay the course, keep doing the good work, you know, do what you um, have to do to protect you and your family. Even though the mask mandate uh, might get lifted, it does not mean that you do not have to, that anything prohibits you from wearing a mask when you're out in public spaces. I'm gonna hand it over to my great colleague and the brainchild behind our weekly uh, health policy brief, uh, Ms. Mary Catherine Crawford. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Doc. I will be brief, um, pun intended. So let's just kick right off. Um, our first recommendation is to improve the lives of the LGBTQ plus um, group of our, our community in Michigan. Um, we need policymakers to continue to mandate equity by ending the discredited and unscientific practices like conversion therapy that perpetuate health disparities, especially facing our vulnerable communities, right? And this is because research has told us that interventions aimed at any kind of gender conformity or orientation are, are coercive and um, cause significant health and behavioral health disparities. Gary introduced this for us and we certainly applaud Governor Whitmer's um, executive order to ban public funding for this kind of conversion therapy. So um, in an effort to include and protect sexual and gender minority communities, this is such a significant milestone to affirm um, and really support that Michigan's LGBTQ plus youth. Um, and as equity and health professionals, we need to continue to encourage policies that are based in evidence and science. And then super quickly, I will go through um, I just really want to talk about the three partisan bills, 285, 303, and 304, that are headed to the House. And collectively, they all ultimately will impose new identification standards for both absentee and in-person voters under the guise of election integrity. And by that, I mean they stem from the false narratives of election fraud that we've been hearing since um, November. So I won't get into each of these. I'll let you go ahead and just take a look at the brief. If you have any questions, you are, of course, more than welcome to email me at crawf457 at msu.edu. And I do just kind of want to say um, quickly the, the reason why I do bring the voting issues to the table is because while we have this amazing news that Juneteenth is officially um, being recognized and celebrated as a federal official official holiday, right? When our voting rights are still under attack, the fight for equity is not over. And I know um, that's been echoed a, quite a couple times through this webinar today, but we do still have a long way to go. Um, but, but, but between this and the, um, the SCOTUS's decision to uphold the Affordable Care Act, uh, we're, we're moving forward in positive directions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Catherine, for those wonderful insights about our, our what we can do with, as relates to policy. We want to encourage you to remember that your voice counts. Dr. Reynolds mentioned research earlier, and we talk about that regularly on the webinar. Immediately following this webinar, the Community Academic Research Engagement Series will be hosted, and this is also sponsored by the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. It's an opportunity for us to learn about some specific research that's happening here in our community and to have input 
The topic today is tailoring a pain and fatigue self-management intervention for long COVID in partnership with Black communities. And so those presenters will be sharing that information with us today. We want to also remind you that there is an opportunity on June 22nd and June 24th for involvement in some activities during Pride Month which is this month. So please visit the University of Michigan Flint website, uh, Pride Game Night, Pride, Pride Ride, and get more information about that. Uh, we also want to remind you that our social workers and community health workers, please fill out the form, identify your particular profession, and get those continuing education units and those social work credits. They are available for you. We want to thank you today for tuning in to the Flint Community Webinar Coronavirus. We ask you to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and even email us again at info at hfrcc.org. Call us at 8 one zero eight three five two one three zero if you need more information or you have questions and we look forward to you being with us right here again next week for our 67th Flint community webinar on coronavirus thank you for joining us today <laughs>